Hey everybody, my name is John Murphy and you're watching or listening to On the Homefront today. This is our last show for 2023 and I want to begin a little differently by thanking you for joining us once in a while. We might be live on the radio here on WILI at AM 1400 or 95.3 on the good old FM. And by the way, give us a button on the car radio, 95.3 AM 1400. Or you're watching us on YouTube, thanks to our camera set up, you can catch us anytime at home on your phone at the radio station's uh, YouTube channel with the other shows. And the whole idea is to give our guests a way to reach you throughout the year, because there's a lot of things happening all around us today, and our local journalism is getting limited all the time. And a lot of people are getting to be less aware of things that are affecting others. And people are trying to find solutions and having a hard time getting access to the media or to our leaders to get answers. So there's kind of a vacuum. And that's why later on this month and in January, we're going to look at issues of the growing movement for tenant rights and tenant unions around the state. There's a lot of housing problems right now. We've been having people on from some of the tenant unions to talk about that movement. But today we're going to start out looking at health care in our region. And later on in the show, we're going to look at live music. If you follow the show, we cover live venues all throughout the region. We're going to look at jazz today with Chris Beaudry from the uh, Old Lime Inn. They've got a wonderful club there called the Side Door Jazz Club. And once in a while we have Chris on to talk about jazz in that part of the state. So that's kind of where we are today. We're very happy to have you with us all the time. And right now I'm very happy to reintroduce Brenda Bookbinder, who's been with us many times talking about health care. She's with the Wyndham United to Save Our Health Care Coalition. And I'm happy to share the studio for a second time with Bill uh, Powers. He's a fellow writer at Neighbors, a wonderful regional publication. And he's very involved with some of his writing in health care issues and other areas as well. So thank you both, Bill. Thanks for being here again. Thank you, too. Thank you. You're welcome. So where we left off last time is a recent decision was made by the Office of Health Strategy that had to do with the Wyndham Hospital challenges about closing the maternity unit. And so what we're going to start out with today with Brenda's help is to kind of bring us up to date on what happened a few days ago in a decision that created a process that's going to create possibly a birthing unit in the region, or it may have Wyndham Hospital re-examining its decision to close the unit. But we're in that limbo stage now after a policy has been worked on, and that's where I can help and have your help to start us out, right? Is that a good start? It is a very good start, John. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Right. And thank you for having us you this bet. afternoon. You bet. Uh, on December 1st, uh, the decision came from the Office of Health Care Strategy and Hartford Healthcare doing business as Wyndham Hospital, uh, agreeing to study a birthing center to enhance women's health care as part of an agreed settlement. And um, the important word is have agreed to study. So this is a feasibility study that was agreed upon um, by an outside provider that Hartford Healthcare would choose uh, to study the issue and whether it's feasible. So right off the bat, I'm thinking, if a maternity unit was not feasible in their eyes, how would a birthing center be feasible in their eyes? So that was confusing for me. I did look at the eight-page document. It is legalese, and it is very confusing. And um, this is from December 1st, right? December 1st, okay. yes. I'm right. still trying to decipher it. Okay. Um, it promises us continued access to affordable health care for the res residents of Wyndham community. Um, and it talks about these are for uh, low-risk births. And they will either establish, operate, or maintain a birth center through a non-hospital affiliate or propose an alternative solution. Now, the, we're going back to the maternal health bill that was introduced by the governor and passed by the legislature just this year that said that um, they would be encouraging birthing centers as independent, freestanding uh, birthing centers not controlled by hospitals. And so that's a dissonance for me. It, it, and, I don't understand how, the state, right? Right, right. how they would take the uh, corporation that closed a maternity unit and ask them to study whether it's okay to open a birthing unit. It seems conflicted to me. Now, um, one thing that we talked about a couple of weeks ago with Rose Reyes was the issue of a timeline, that it was kind of left a little vague right now. 
And I guess after three years of processing, uh, they're asking for data collection now that might have been done before. Mm -hmm. and if I understand correctly, of course, I'm still learning myself, but we're looking into this. And you know, the whole idea is more delay with no idea of an end date, right? That's giving people a little stress right now. Very much so. Please. I want to talk a little bit about trust in this community for health care, benefits and consequences. Uh, when Wyndham Community Memorial Hospital was fully functioning in 1933, it was the Depression. It was built by community funds. And for every service that they built in, it was announced to the community. Uh, people were allowed to go in and look at it. Um, many people would donate trust funds or, or help it keep it going. So when the first birth happened uh, at Nagaio on April 25th, 1933, they cheered one birth. And the next day, eight other pregnant women were moved there. So um, there were nine then. Um, and very excited about that. We're not looking at the baseline of 200 births as we are today. So trust and, and um, so we had um, an ICU for about 80 years in an uh, intensive care unit and a maternity unit for 87 years through the Depression, through waves of immigration, wars, um, feast and famine. When, when we had lean years, people would donate more to keep the place going. Um, so when Hartford HealthCare came in in 2008, they promised to enhance services and keep them close to home. And very recently, the CEO from Hartford HealthCare has promised that no Connecticut community would be left behind. Again, this dissonance, I'm saying on what measure? On what measure are you not leaving somebody behind? Now, if you're buying a car, if you're buying your groceries, if you're buying shoes, you're going to be looking at the quality of it, the cost of it, and does it benefit me to buy this? Is this a feasible thing, or will this not last? Those are commodities, too. That, well, they are, and healthcare kind of... services have been considered, or con considered consumers here. So, I know. patients are okay. becoming consumers. So when think. the news yeah. came of 90 nurses being fired in one day, there's dissonance for me. I don't understand why enhancing services would require 90 nurses to get pink slips in one day. When the ICU was closed in 2015, when the medical staff and the community rose up and said, why are you doing this? The answer was, we're doing this. And again, my dissonance, why? Um, when the maternity unit was closed in June 2020, they had not filed a, a certificate of yeah. need, and there was no community forum to discuss the decision before they made it. Yeah. Very different from the uh, opening to the community that happened all those years with the community hospital. Uh, what the people were invited. What fine that was issued for that? Remember, there was a procedure. They whittled fine? it down to sixty-five thousand dollars. It was one hundred and ten, I think. Uh, okay. And, yeah, they it was like they an negotiated down. Fine mm -hmm. Yeah, for, not for all the days that they had it closed and and uh, had okay. not filed it. Yeah. Um, my, our concern consequences. So let's say from uh, two thousand twenty in June going on till now, three and a half years, we have no idea the consequences of those outsourced births. So that year that OHS and Hartford HealthCare studied and talked and negotiated, there was no request for what are the consequences of the three years you've been doing this, because that matters to the birthing center model. And we're talking about our C-section rate still remains at 35.4% of all births. And meanwhile, it's only 20% of all births are complicated. So there's a disproportionate... Is that statewide now? Yes, statewide. it's statewide. Okay. Mm -hmm. figure, okay. We don't know how many premature babies. We don't know how much postpartum depression. And we don't know about the complications in mother and child. We don't know. Um, Connecticut has approved a, a mortality study for mothers and babies that die. But they're not studying what are the things that help mothers survive and babies survive. What are the consequences of consolidating and sending um, basic services for childbirth away? So when the hospital staff and the medical staff are completing all their paperwork records, is this data normally collected and the problem is now having access to it? Or are these things not part of their documentation yet? 
it, there's nothing in the documentation of the the study. There's nothing about any of these factors. Um, okay, I, so I, there was kind of a gap right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Yep. Well, you've identified part of the issue. You know, without blaming things, it's like, well, this is a real. It vacuum. doesn't. Okay. It doesn't make sense. It's right. not a rational course yeah. of action, and I, I don't understand that. Um, now I tell you what. Let me bring in Bill Powers now, because Bill, <laughs> as a writer and journalist, has been covering this for a while. And since we've had, you know, Brenda kind of set the stage a little bit about what happened earlier in December, you've been at this for a while, Bill. So thank you for being here. And kind well, of walk us through your steps. Okay, so well, far. I, about a year ago, I requested OHS to put me on their mailing list so I received information. And I, I have now and then received some information, not only about this issue, but a, a few other issues as okay. well. Um, but I'm new to, to this. Um, Meaning that when I received the OHS uh, uh, statement on a news release uh, from December 1st, that's when I got very interested, um, more interested. Because when I read it, there was nothing at all, uh, unfortunately, about the closing of Wyndham Hospital. It was only about establishing birthing centers, a birthing center in this area. That's all. And so... I found it confusing, evasive, self-serving with respect to both OHS and um, and uh, Wyndham Hospital, and in many cases just totally misleading. Um, now, uh, as a result of that, uh, what I did was I wrote a letter to the Chronicle that was uh, in last week, and I, tr I tried to point out the fact that Birthing centers are not inpatient obst uh, obstetrical services. They are totally different things, totally different purposes. Uh, one is for moms without any risk or at low at risk moms and babies. The other is for people where, that have come in that have run into complications and where they're going to go. There's only yeah. one certified center in Connecticut. It's in Danbury, and believe it or not, and one of the big question things is they're supposed to in terms of various rules, is establish the birthing center within the vicinity of a full, uh, full-fledged medical medical center or hospital that has obstetrical services. Now the question is, I think uh, the question, uh, what is vicinity? And Danbury Hospital, uh, the birthing center, is 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 independent, but it's across the street. That's that's what I call vicinity. It's not cross town. It's yeah. across the street. It's not the difference between Willimantic and Norwich. Right. So uh, the reason I wrote that is Maureen Murphy, who, yep. who writes for the Chronicle. Yeah. Okay. She wrote an article basically essentially praising the folks locally here who are making the good fight. And that, that impressed me. And so I got in touch with some of these folks that are making the good fight, including Brenda and Rose Reyes and uh, Lynn Eyed and people have been doing this for some time. Yeah, and uh, I've been talking with them, interviewing them, interviewing people from Har trying to interview people from Hartford Healthcare, and also, of course, from OHS. I've sent many questions to the hospital. I've sent many questions to um, OHS. It has been very difficult getting quite answers. They're either incomplete uh, or non-existent. Huh. And so I filed a freedom, you just mentioned, a freedom yeah. of information yeah. uh, request with uh, with the state to get that information. And I checked it out with, with uh, the FOI folks, and they said, absolutely. Anything that they have in terms of their meetings, their negotiation meetings uh, and so forth, would be should be available. In, you know, any notes that they have, any minutes that right. they have, all of that's available, even recordings of their minutes. Um, so we should be able to learn much more. They wouldn't even provide me either w with who the people were who um, negotiated for them. Hmm. And so it leads, you know, so there's a lot of questions about who negotiated, yeah. where they negotiated, and, and, and what, what was involved with that. That's happening more and more often, too. You know, for example, Bill Powers has been with Neighbors now for a little over five years. And I want to mention Neighbors, too. It's a community resource for information and news. It comes out every month. This is the December issue. It's in color. 
It's been out here for many, many years. It's published by Tom King. And Bill is part of a collective of writers that put this out every month, and they cover all kinds of topics, environmental issues, food, the arts, education. You know, Bill writes on many topics. But when you've tried to get information, have you had uh, you know, other trouble getting replies, or has this been the most difficulty you've had trying to get people uh, to respond to you oh, as a writer for a publication? Oh, I've never had a problem before getting people to respond about anything in terms of interviews and so forth, okay. except for this. Uh, I'm, I'm being, you know, there, there are words for it, but um, I'm being stonewalled. I, I feel like I'm being stonewalled. And there may be other, other reasons for it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I'm amazed that I can't get it. I used to work at Hartford Hospital. I was an administrator at Hartford Hospital years ago and other, other medical uh, institutions. And uh, I, it wasn't like that when I was there. They were up front. They were actually devoted to, to, to people in the, in, in the neighborhood, in the city, in the lo locality. Uh, I was there when we got the helicopter service in. Oh, yeah. And I even testified for the Connecticut State Firemen's Association when I was still working at Hartford Hospital because I was a volunteer firefighter out of Mansfield at the time, and they asked me to go and testify. So, I mean, but th there were lots of improvements that Hartford Hospital in the past has brought. It's different than Hartford Healthcare. It's, it, to me, anyway, it seems like that. All right, well, this is a good point to take a break right now. You're watching or listening to On the Home Front today, uh, and we're here today with uh, Brenda Bookbinder and uh, Bill Powers. We'll come back and continue our conversation later in the show, by the way, in case you're viewing this. Uh, we'll be talking about live jazz at the Side Door Jazz Club in Old Lime Inn, a beautiful location for music. As part of coverage we do throughout the region for live music venues. We'll take a break for a couple of short messages. Don't go away. Back live on the home front, we're very happy to have you with us. We're going to continue our conversation about health care in eastern Connecticut. And then later on in the show, we have a special guest joining us, Chris Beaudry. We'll be talking about live jazz as we come to the end of the year and looking ahead into the winter. But right now, we're going to come back with Brenda and Bill Powers. I want to mention, too, the website for Neighbors. As I said before, it's a free publication. It's neighborspaper.com. That's the website. There's a full archive there. The first issue is always there. The current issue is always there. And what they've done in the last couple of months, some of the writers like Bill have separate pages with a small archive of their writing. So if you want to follow Bill's work, there's a section there. And if you just go to the main website, it's all there for you, neighborspaper.com. It's a great resource, especially if you're new to our community. You can learn a lot every month about what's going on because there's a lot of good things happening here, and you don't find out about them in many places. So, Bill, uh, mm -hmm. you know, before we leave the topic of journalism, is there anything else about your coverage you want to share? Because this is ongoing for you, I guess, and the whole process is moving forward. Uh, like I said, this is the beginning of, of something that's going to be, I hope, in, in Neighbors. Uh, I have, for ne next month, starting the first week in January, okay. for the January-February issue, uh, I have an article that's called Local Moms and, and, Neighbor, uh, and Newborns uh, Abandoned. And it's about my experience so far and the fact that we've tried and some of the questions that I think are important to be asked, you know, while, while, and, uh, well, and many of the questions that I've asked that aren't these questions still have not been answered. So it's kind of frustrating when you're trying to get answers and you get, you get no answers from, from the hospital and you get vague answers or incomplete answers from OHS. They promised me they're going to do more, but I'm still waiting. So no way. Yeah. Well, you know, Brenda is with the Windy United to Save Our Healthcare yes. Coalition, which has many, many partners. So when they go over this stuff, do you have a sense of what their major unanswered questions are after all the discussions, their biggest takeaways that they want more on? Because it's a huge list. So what are their most urgent questions? Do. Yeah. I think it is the um, promise to enhance women's services here with the birthing center. And then backtracking with giving the healthcare corporation that took the maternity unit away with studying the feasibility of one, which means they have room to say it's not feasible. Now, <laughs> back to consequences. Uh, we're asking why in the three years there's been no study of the impact of the closed unit on the women and families here. Um, there is a prenatal and a postnatal 
uh, service at women's services at Wyndham Hospital. So they know who registers and they know who comes back. That would be very easy to get the statistics. How many of them had C-sections? How many of them gave birth on ED? How many of them gave birth on the side of the road? Um, how many of them um, had postpartum depression? They could get all of that from their own statistics. So it's just a matter of, you know, not being transparent. I mean, we've heard nothing from Wyndham Hospital or Hartford Healthcare since December 1st, since this decision reinforced and said, well, what you did illegally is okay. Well, Brenda, the thing to recall is that they claim in, they claim in the information that was sent out that this is a final decision with a couple of ifs, if they do the study and if they accept it. So how could it be a final decision if there's a couple, if in, indeed there are two ifs involved, whether or not they choose to do the study or have an independent study done, and then following if they want to do a birth study. But it doesn't really matter because of the fact that others might be able to do birth, uh, birthing centers. But the fact is that one, a birthing center, does not fulfill the need for an obstet obstetrical, an inpatient obstetrical unit. Just, they're, they're two totally different things, designed for different th things and, and, and staffed by different kinds of professionals. So you're helping me so I don't scratch my head too much. Bear with me, folks. <laughs> uh, so it's all about the definition of what a birthing unit is. Yes. And the feasibility of that specific definition is the question in relation to, well, it could do other things, but the definition doesn't include it, right? Not, not exactly, okay. because, because people are trying to figure out. Right, exactly. In yeah. What's enclosed in the definition of a birthing center is, is not to do emergent care. That's not what it's all about. In fact, in fact the... Um, the March of Dimes, which has some, some in, in, interesting work published, in, interesting work about that, are the people that say it should be, they should be in the vicinity of a full-service maternity unit, not, and, and what does vicinity mean? I don't think it means 16, 17 miles away on, on, on old, tw twisting or winding country roads, right. uh, you know, or, and, on, on a snowy day, that's not what that means. It's more like what happens in Danbury. With the, that's the only certified center in Connecticut. Do They're you, across the street. Do you know of other ones that are in the process and they're just not there yet? That's I, I, What I believe is, I think it served, this serves the purpose of, of, of OH, OHS. Um, oh very nicely because I think it's part of their overall strategy to improve things and there's nothing wrong with a birthing center they're great they you know they, they many of them will be will be staffed with nurse um, um, midwives who have who have some, some good training they can do some interventions at times but they can't do what they, there's no anesthesiologist there right you know, there, there's no um, uh, OBGYN physician there, doctor there typically. They are, they are set aside, standalone, but they are for, they are set up to serve women who are not at risk, and who are having babies that are not known to be at risk. Yeah, to help them have a healthy baby. Oh, a absolutely. Okay. And to, to make, to do it in a comfortable setting, yeah. you know, and um, rather than necessarily w w home, depending on folk, where f folks live, it's not probably the, the best situation for some folks to have the baby at home, especially if you have a lot of kids running around already. Um, but um, the, the thing here is the definitions, I think, are clear to the state and they're clear to the hospital. There's no, that's why I say it's confusing. It, it, it just doesn't, if you read it closely, uh, you, it doesn't make a lot of sense that they would appear to confuse the two, either in the press release or in some of the other things that, that they are okay. they are trying to have the public believe from what they have written, what the state has written. Okay. Does so, that help? Yes, it does, because okay. that's one, you know, as, as uh, you know, as confusing as the outcome is, it helps to, you know, to define one area that's becoming clearer that they need to do is how is the unit defined and where is it located in relation to other services that are not included. Uh, but are there other areas, Brenda, you know, other questions on top of that one? We do have other questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Our certificate of need hearing was on November 10th, 2021, and we submitted thousands of petitions to keep it open. Uh, we have... Uh, 
speakers and testimonies, two hours worth of them. But before all that happened, two days earlier, uh, our Attorney General, William Tong, wrote a letter and submitted this to OHS. Um, and he wrote... Is that from November now? When is that? November 8th. November two 8th. days before. Okay, November two 8th. days before. You better so tell the decision. The year. Tell them the year. 2021. On okay. the decision there, they wrote 2022. They made oh, an error. A typo. They also made the okay. error. They said this agreement was between Wyndham Hospital and OHS. It's not. Wyndham Hospital is no longer an entity alone. It's Hartford Healthcare, Healthcare. Corporation doing business as Wyndham Hospital. Right. So that's not accurate. Right. I'm confused. Okay. <laughs> He wrote this very interesting thing here. There was a 2021, a year after the unit had closed, a community health needs assessment that said that the Wyndham Hospital's service area includes Wyndham and Chaplin, both distressed municipalities, Columbia, Coventry, Hampton, Lebanon, Mansfield, and Scotland. So this is not just a Willimantic problem. Mm -hmm. These are the surrounding towns. And he talks about adding obstacles to health care, including racial and ethnic health and economic disparities, systematic racism, language barriers, poverty, lack of access to health insurance, routine health care, unemployment, food and housing insecurity, and lack of transportation. These are poor outcomes our health care system must strive to rectify by adding services, not taking them away. And this is from the Attorney General. Um, is this so, to... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, to that end, I strongly urge your office to closely examine this application and balance the benefits ending obstetric services at Wyndham Hospital with the consequences of doing so. That's the study and that's the accountability and the transparency we're looking for. And has not come from this very well-endowed healthcare corporation that has people that do this quality control and, and yeah. all kinds of medical records. and all. This would not be a difficult thing for them to get. And part of it's smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. This, this uh, well, That was a couple of years ago. That. No, 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 but, but Wait, December 1st. Yeah. This, this thing that they put out on December 1st as a press release literally fails to let you know, the reader know, that the birthing centers have anything at all to do with with the case at hand. The case at hand was actually, that you find later through a link, was actually, um, in terms of where the, where the final decision was made, had to do with the project, which was called, in quotes, termination of inpatient obstetric services. That is... That's why it's so. One of the reasons why it's so confusing. They don't even tell you. I mean, it sounds sounds really good. Well, they're going to have birthing ser services or centers in Connecticut, which is not a bad thing. But they fail to mention that this is good. They're going to provide a trade-off here in Wyndham for a full-fledged maternity service, and that, and, and you find that when you when you dig a little bit into it and and you, you do a little critical reading. Well, Sorry. that's what's going to no, happen. No, in that's, 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 no, March. that's okay. Yeah. Um, Attorney, you, <laughs> Attorney General uh, Tong says, consider what steps might be taken to bolster community-based prenatal and postpartum uh, services for, for the high-need population. And finally, this last thing about ensuring that tra charitable gifts are given for the purposes consistent with the don donation intent. When people would give to the maternity unit, when they mm -hmm. would give to prenatal services, they would target their trust fund and all that. Hartford Healthcare is made one lump foundation, one pot. Huh. So you can't target donations? You can't target. What you, they decide where the money is going to go. Oh. Hmm. So they can say there's not enough to support a maternity unit, but maybe there were donations enough to sustain it, and we'll never know. Well, if they don't know, accept money and take an obligation and like an in-kind, good-faith match, well, okay, that's tactical, I guess. Because, because I, like to, I like to write about history. One, one thing about before Wyndham Hospital was founded, there was a reason for it. There was St. Joseph's Hospital yes. prior to that. St. Joseph's Hospital was, uh, man, was, was womaned by uh, the Sisters of Charity, whose base was in the Netherlands. They recalled the sisters back to the Netherlands. And so here was Wyndham without 
and you know any resources for a hospital. There's a vacuum, yeah. A absolutely, it was a tremendous vacuum. The other thing I want to point out, because I've done some research and writing about this, is that during the Spanish flu, large number of nurses that were taking care of the influenza patients in Willimantic, and many of the nursing students died doing that at St. Joseph's Hospital. Wow. So in the old days, charity hospitals were important. I think, unfortunately, out of the, the newer models of healthcare and healthcare management, yeah. the charity has somehow, unfortunately, evaporated that yeah. piece of it yeah. for some people. So, um, and, and that's where, you know, I, I, I have to wonder, you know, about the goals and objectives. They state the goals and objectives for helping the people in Wyndham, yes. for instance, yeah. but are they fo following through? The, they, they took away our critical care unit, uh, you know, before that. Doctors, OBGYN folks back then had enough problems with paying their insurance, their malpractice bills. Yeah. And so what, what was unfortunately happening then was uh, Hartford HealthCare pulled, uh, you referring to, pulled the, the critical care units out of, out of, out of and so they, they didn't want to have any problems in a delivery room and not have, it, have anywhere nearby to take their patient. Right. It would have been better to have it in the, in the hospital itself. So you can't blame them for going elsewhere to practice. It's a combination of shared liability or individual yes. protection. Yeah, it's real hard. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's why we do these conversations and installments with different guests. When Susan Johnson was here a while ago, State Representative Stu uh, Susan Johnson, we were talking about how years ago decisions were made about privatizing health care. Mm -hmm. uh, over publicly funding it. Yes. And when you privatize a business, then it's off the books. Right. They can say, no, go away, have a nice day. And then how do you hold them accountable when a public entity has some kind of accountability? And when it's the private sector's goal of profit generation, when they're dealing with goods and products and services, that applies yes. well, obviously, very well. But healthcare is a different animal. It's like, you know, so, it's not a commodity like hogs. It's a big corn. business, it's a, but it's a big business. It's one of the biggest. Yeah. So the question is, how do you mitigate the issue of generating profits means the business models succeed in their in a design, but that level of profit is lost health care that becomes a gap for others because the money's not there for it. And it's like a lose-lose or a win-win. It's really hard. Well, there's another piece to this, Please. part of the triangle. Yeah. Uh, consumers like all of us in this room Okay, are caught in a crossfire between healthcare industry, big business model, and insurance companies, yeah. including government insurance. So we're caught in the crossfire. And many, I th unfortunately, many, many innocent people, just like in some places in big cities now, innocent people walking down the street get caught in the crossfire and lose their lives. This is unfortunately what's going to happen. And, yeah. and I, I don't... I, I see this, this thing going on with moms and babies, uh, unfortunately, at possibly the tip of the iceberg in terms of what other services yeah. we're going to be losing because certain people have the, have the uh, opportunity to shift, to shift the, insure, the, the money that they make from insurance to places where it's better insured and the costs are less yeah. as opposed to meeting people's needs. Yeah, I guess sometimes they call those efficiencies, right? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but not, but you, it's good to have efficiency and effectiveness. Yeah, it's good when you have the both together. Yeah. All right. We well, are still waiting for uh, Johnson Memorial and Sharon Hospital, who are also in difficult areas, yes. have their maternity units suspended and are. That's been in the papers lately, too. Absolutely, absolutely. And these three hospitals are closed during post-pandemic. They're all in high-needs areas. Yeah. And uh, before that, there have never been, uh, in Connecticut, a closure of a maternity unit in a distressed area. So this is a phenomenon that um, the consequences we won't know of maybe two years from now, hmm. um, how dire the effect of this is. But we are calling for accountability of benefits and consequences. 
All right. Well, this is where we're going to close our conversation on this for now, but we'll have folks back again each month as we can with different guests. As the system moves forward, we'll be able to have conversations and try to get people in on the phone who can't be with us here in the studio. But I want to thank a Brenda Bookbinder from the Windy United to Save Our Healthcare Coalition and also Bill Powers from Neighbors Publication for being here and for all your good work behind the scenes. And hopefully we'll have you back as this moves forward later in the spring. Okay? Thank you, John, for right. the, so much. the openness for having us. For having us. You bet. We'll just say for now to be continued, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, we're going to take a, a break for one very short message, and then we're going to talk about live jazz. So stay with us here on the home front. Here on the home front, you can see right now I've got my my uh, headphones here. This is my Captain Video uh, helmet set up here because we're on the phone. And one thing we do throughout the year is talk about live music, which is very important to me, and we try to support all the venues across the region. Sometimes we'll talk about the Packing House in Wellington, or we'll talk about uh, the Stomping Ground up in Putnam. But right now we're going to talk about a great place for jazz at the Old Lime Inn. It's called the Side Door Jazz Club. It's a wonderful venue that's really growing in reputation and quality of jazz over the last couple of years. And we have a phone call right now with Chris Beaudry, who is a musician himself, but in this capacity, He's a manager and programmer at the side door. And uh, Chris, I think you're with us. Uh, happy holidays and welcome aboard. Hey, John. Happy holidays. Good to be back. I hope uh, everything's going well. And uh, yeah, definitely firing on all cylinders over here. That's for sure. Oh, man. I see your Facebook posts and the emails you send, and you are hopping. You're like you're in the middle of Midtown Manhattan almost, it seems like. Uh, so what's the response been since, like, Halloween? Because we had you on in the fall, and uh, it's been a while, but how have things been the last month or so for live music and jazz? And then we'll talk about the holiday programs you have coming up. Well, I like to uh, keep a little running analysis of, uh, you know, how the shows are doing and how they're selling, and yeah. I highlight sold-out shows in green on my spreadsheet, and I tell you, it's the most density of green that I've seen um, in any period of time of this jazz club, since, at least since I've been there, but I know that you know it took them a few years to get up and running. But I think yeah. uh, it, it's really—I mean, it's just—it's kind of mind-boggling uh, the amount of sold-out streaks we've been having. Uh, we have a double sold-out New Year's Eve show coming up with uh, Champion Fulton, who uh, many of you may or may not know. She actually uh, headlines the Litchfield Jazz Festival uh, right. every so often. She, she has a regular gig at the Carlisle in New York City, like the top of the line again. Um, well, two years ago, we started the New Year's with Samara Joy, and look what happened to her. My um, goodness. She, yeah, I saw her at <laughs> UConn. It was a flip-out show. She is, she's gonna, she's got a piece of it, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we the, the caliber's still there, and now the numbers to boot. I mean, people are just, uh, I honestly, I haven't done much in the way of social media or much. I mean, word of mouth is just is carrying us along, and it's just growing exponentially. Well, since you've been at it now for a while, have you noticed more musicians interested in going on the road now compared to when you started programming? It seems like there's a lot of people going from you heading up north on the coastline, and I wonder if you notice that, and that's a trend nowadays. Uh, I can't speak to you know what people's tours look like, but I know for a fact that you know we're so close to New York City, um, it's very common that they do a one-off with us. But a lot of times, like you mentioned, they do continue up uh, to Jimmy's Jazz in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Right. Uh, Scullers, Scullers in Boston is another one. Uh, right. But uh, there, you know, I mean, there's uh, only a few jazz clubs uh, in the Northeast Corridor, but you know, I mean, who knows? Maybe there'll be more one day. You know, one thing I want to do, folks, so without going overboard, is paint a picture to you, because this is a very intimate little club that might have 80 people, maybe 90. What nope. do you think the max nope. is? Nope. At the side door, 68 by fire code. There you go, 68. Hear that by fire code, folks. 68, though. That tells you how close you are. And I've been there for some shows, and it is really nice. Uh, nice ceilings. The sound is really good. Uh, how is the club been going in relation to the work at the Old Lime Inn? Are they mutually helping each other a lot? Are they independent, or is one helping the other no, these no. days? Uh, they're, I mean, they, they're uh, mutually, I mean, they, they are symbiotic. So people come, they they. Uh, dine in the restaurant. They stay at the at the hotel. I've actually seen more um, regulars, I guess you could call them, that that come for that full experience. I mean, we have one couple that comes from uh, Providence, Rhode Island, at least once a month, and they stay two nights. They see both shows. They go to dinner both nights, and then they stay for the jazzy brunch on Sunday. Wow! Um, and they do that, yeah, once or, or twice, you know, every couple months, uh, every month uh, in the summer. I think they were there. But yeah, we have a lot of regulars, um, and like I said, I think just the word is, is getting out there um, 
a lot of first timers, a lot of uh, you know special occasion date nights. But then you know people come for their first time, and it's definitely not the last. They get hooked real fast. So the side door is at the 85 Lime Street in town, and I wonder if you talk about maybe how you're using uh, the web or whatever to communicate and archive your work so people can stay in touch and plan ahead with you for music all throughout the season. Sure. Uh, well, first and foremost, you can access our calendar at SideDoorJazz.com, um, although I think the, the URL might be the SideDoorJazz.com. Yeah. Um, we bought, bought a bunch of the URLs that were the same, and some of them may have expired, but the SideDoorJazz.com. Or you could go to oldlimein.com, and all of the information is there. We've right. got the calendar on the website. Uh, but if you go to the sidedoorjazz.com, I recommend signing up for the email newsletter. That is uh, far and away our most um, uh, most effective way of communicating with uh, with our fans. And, and we have, like, an open rate of 50%, which is kind of unheard of for email newsletters. Um, and, yeah, I, I try to do that once a week. We nice. have, um, you know, we're... we're we're working on being sold out for we are sold out for new year's we have the great nat reeves um of uh, hartford fame but oh, international wonderful. as well yeah. he'll be there on saturday he's got 10 tickets left uh, and we're doing a jam session again so inviting the community to come through this friday we call it the home for the holidays jam session um but then we kick off next year with uh, bill charlap for three nights uh and then we just announced through basically uh, the month of march we got jimmy green coming for three nights uh, we just had Christian Sands for three nights. Oh, nice. uh, we're doing a lot of three-day weekends just because we need to add to uh, handle all the uh, at-capacity shows or beyond. So it's great. It's a good problem to have. It is, and when you have sixty-eight in the you know sixty-eight chairs, you know with a good draw, that can really get it rolling. Yeah. Well, uh, we may have squeezed seventy or more uh, for a lot of these recent shows, but uh, people don't complain. You know, a lot of people just. They arrive and they're like, I'll stand. I just want to see the music. I want to hear this artist, you know. So um, definitely a lot of diehard fans. And even people who aren't so much into jazz or have kind of, um, you know, not, not a thorough, thorough understanding of what they might be in for, they, they come and they experience it. And I think they discover they like something new because jazz kind of has, um, I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of hidden, it means different things to different people. Um, but it can be a lot of things and maybe a lot of those things that people haven't experienced. Like we had uh, a Latin septet the other night, uh, Ed Fast. He actually plays on uh, many a Broadway show and tours nationally with like Wicked, uh, but he's from Old Lyme. Wow. And he did like a homecoming show and he had three percussionists out front. He had guitar, he had vibraphone, uh, bass, drums, piano. I mean, it was just a spectacle of a show more, more than anything. But yeah, uh, there's something for everybody. So just give it a shot. OldLimeN.com, SideDoorJazz.com. Now, what's the connection, you think, to some of the musicians you see on tour and some of the emerging music students from some of the schools that are really getting serious chops and they want to get out and play and they're writing? I see them in Providence once in a while. I just wondered what kind of mix you have to draw upon with such a rich history. When you use the word jazz, it's almost misleading nowadays because there's so many sounds. But how do you, right. you know, how do you mix it up with what's available? That's got to be a fun part of your job, though, is grazing and looking around. Well, uh, I will say this: a lot of the artists that come through, um, since it is a smaller room, you know, their fee not, might not be what a what a, a festival fee is. Let's say, right. Um, but so what they do to kind of curb expenses is, is they hire locally, and there and there's not like they're trying to get the artists for cheap. What they're trying to do is just you know budget their tour. Yeah. Um, but that that works to the benefit of the youngsters who are just coming out on the scene. You know, the new burgeoning artists. And I tell you, um, we had um, Delfio Marsalis and then Jason Marsalis, of course, of the infamous uh, Marsalis family. Winton Marsalis is kind of the uh, you know the older brother yeah. of the whole group, and and um, uh, Branford Marsalis, but uh, he, he played with Sting and, and lots of others, but he's jazz. But, um, I mean, these, these are jazz royalty, and they came through Connecticut, and they hired half of their band from the Hart School. So, wow. like, that, that opportunity is uh, allotted because, you know, the club is here, and it's, it's a beacon for these giant artists, and, you know, they may not be traveling with their, their full bands that they do, you know, the festival dates with, but they come... And they hire the young talent, and these kids sound amazing. I mean, we had, uh, I'll throw some names out there. Dylan Rowland uh, has played a couple of gigs. Um, there's a saxophonist at uh, Hart that's played a couple of gigs with the Marcellus Brothers. But, yeah, I mean, it's what an opportunity for those kids, too. So it's, it's kind of, you know, carrying the torch and, and keeping the music alive and, and uh, giving it a taste of, um, you know, not only the newcomers to the, to the, to the established artists, but 
uh, vice versa, the established artists to the newcomers. Yeah. You know, something I wanted to ask about, too, I'm sure you're noticing it, is that, you know, a few decades ago, jazz fusion was, uh, you know, for some people, opening the family tree to a whole new generation of sound, and some people felt sure. it was a change that maybe lost some of the purity of the past. But what I've noticed in recent years is some people are really trying to work improvisation and music with rap and hip-hop, and some yeah. lyrical power, along with jazz, incredible solos, rhythm sections, the whole thing. And I wondered sure. if you noticed that more on the on the bands that they're trying to reach younger audiences so they can get into jazz and learn some of the history about like Charles Mingus and yeah. these kind of guys. Well, it's not it's not that um, they're trying to reach younger artists. They are the younger artists. Right. So they, they, they grew up with this hip-hop. Like, uh, for instance, Braxton Cook played the club uh, and he had, um, you know, tinges of, of R&B, hip-hop, um, soul. You know, he, he sang, he played saxophone, he played electric keyboards. Uh, very modern sound. Do, uh, the synth sounds now could could throw you for a loop for the real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know he, he's a, a prime example of that. Obviously, Robert Glasper is uh, one of the biggest doing doing the thing. Um, you know, plays with uh, you know big names from uh, Yassine Bey, Most Def, to um, you know all kinds of names. Um, so the cross genre, um, yeah, fusion stuff that Miles Davis started with Bitches Brew in 1971. Right. Um, I, had, I had the pleasure to work with Lenny White, who was on that album with uh, yeah. Jack D. Jeanette. But um, yeah, I mean, they started the rock rock fusion. Now it's hip hop, rock. I mean, everything with the, the dawn of the internet. <laughs> no, no, uh, no holds barred. You know, the sky's the limit for for uh, collaborative um, creativity. Well, I congratulate you on your success since you've gotten there, Chris, and for helping uh, the jazz community connect to an audience of musicians that is a little far away to go on a weeknight, but going to Old Lyme is pretty damn close compared to downtown Manhattan. And, That's right. Uh, you know, having that quality here is really great, and I wish you a great year ahead. We'll be talking again periodically as the schedules move out. But once again, folks, the Side Door Jazz Club is at Old Lime Inn, 85 Lime Street in uh, Old Lime, Connecticut. And uh, Side Door Jazz or The Side Door Jazz, you'll find it, uh, and you'll find out the whole program, Chris. So thanks again for joining us today and for all the good work you're doing, and we'll look forward to staying in touch. All right. Thanks again, John. Happy holidays and uh, Happy New Year. All right. Take care. You as well. All righty. Okay, I'm going to get my uh, Captain Video helmet off here just for the last part of the show. How are we doing for time now? We're almost done. Okay, so we'll be talking. Uh, I talked to, uh, to uh, Terry Paquette from the Stomping Ground last week, but he wasn't able to be here today. We'll get him in January, and the Packing House will get very busy after the holiday, and we'll get uh, some folks from there right up on Route 32. I wanted to share a little bit of news that we have coming up here. Uh, some interviews are going to open up some grant opportunities. If you're an artist, there's going to be some new programs coming from the Assets for Artists program. This is through Mass Mocha. I'm going to be having a phone call with Molly Rideout, and they're doing special things for crowdfunding for projects, how to put together markets and magazines, uh, project management. Uh, how to create a sustainable creative business. So these are free workshops that are available online to help you know artists who are trying to get to become more sustainable. It's more than a hobby. They want to try to make a living with it at some scale, and they need to get their act together. That's why these are so great. You can just go to Mass Mocha. Actually, the best site to go to for all of this is assetsforartists.org. And it's all there, assetsforartists.org. I got this email 10 days ago. We're going to have Molly on in a couple of weeks. Something else I want to mention while I have a minute is up in Mansfield on January 17th. This is the third in a series of meetings that's trying to develop community support to set up a cultural district in Mansfield with the different art and commerce areas. They met in November. They met uh, in December. Uh, I was at that meeting uh, to get input from artists, and they're having a community meeting uh, Wednesday, January 17th at 530 at the Town Council Chambers up in Mansfield. And it's going to be their last meeting to get information so some committee can make a decision about applying or not. If they're applying, they'll need some local funding, and they'll also get government support on the other end to really help the, the economy. So it's a nice opportunity. Other towns around the state are doing this now, and they're trying to see if it can happen just up the road. So anyway, that's uh, January 17th at 530, and we'll talk about that more uh, 
later in January. So that's it for this week. I want to thank you very much for the time you share with me here on the home front, whether it's on the radio or on YouTube. I appreciate that. I want to thank all my guests who took the time to be here to share their good stories. Uh, and we'll stay on top of this and keep going for 2024. So thank you again for everything, and we wish you the very best. Keep the faith, and we'll see you next week.